what's going on, fellas? Are you up for some stories? <laughs> so, I took this out, um, I guess it was yesterday, Saturday night, right? Yeah, Saturday night. And, you know, remember I said I had it pretty much RTF, but I still ended up working on it Friday night for seven hours straight after I already thought I had it ready to fly. But it seemed like it was pretty good to go there. The one big thing I was worried about uh, when I got to the field, because I've never put the wings on this plane, but it's a used plane, so I figured they'd fit on pretty good. But, you know, I did all the work on the wings and synchronized all the servos on the wings um, through the SmartFly EQ-10E. Uh, e. um, I did all that, like, months ago. So I had forgotten, you know, what... Um, color coding that I had done but I was pretty sure it was probably black because three servos per wing I was pretty sure it was black on the inside red in the middle and blue on the outside but I couldn't be sure if it wasn't blue in the middle and red on the outside and so I thought well that's my one hang up I'm going to have when I get to the field I'm going to have to sort that out and make sure that I'm in the right channel you know there's some um, the right servo for each channel because there's three servos per channel on on that setup through the smart fly and they're all set up different you know different sub trims different endpoints i don't want to get messed up you know so this is on my mind you know i take a nap <coughs> actually i took a good sleep and then i got out there like an hour and a half before dark saturday night and then i i go to putting things together and i start battling with the those aileron wires first and and um i guess right that I did them black on the inboard servo, red in the middle servo, and blue on the outboard. But <laughs> the night before, I had put the pigtails off the smart fly and attached them to the fuselage so they'd be ready for when the wings plugged in. Now, for me, um, you know, I I want to switch to one of the new radios. They have higher frame rates and everything, but just been lazy because I know Futaba. Futaba was pretty much the best radio going when I started 23 years ago. So um, I'm, you know, I've always used it. And so i familiar, you know, and, um, you know, the, the ailerons on a two aileron plane are always one in six. I mean, the default is one in six. So I've always made the left wing one and the right wing six. All my planes from the beginning of my time have been set up that way. I can always count on it. And then elevators are two and seven, and the left one for me is always two, the right one's always seven, so I could always count on those in all my planes. And somehow the night before, after working seven hours and being super tired, um, I had guessed right about the colors, but I put all the right wing servo leads on to the left side, and the left one's onto the right side. <laughs> so, that ended up being, I don't know, an hour and 15 minutes to sort that out. And then all that wire cable management that I had done, I had to cut all loose because you can't really be for sure what color wire is going through a bundle, you know. So everything I took apart. And um, that, was a, that was demoralizing. And I got all that done. And then I got the rest of the plane put together. And now I just have about 100 other things that I'm hope is going to go okay but that that really killed me and it was hot and sweaty and then bugs eating your arms and everything and your ears and yeah I lived through all that and then all I got to do is start it well it's a broken motor um and the sun's pretty much set I think at that point the sun had already set but we got pictures so I go well at least we got pictures do a dry run I'm always ready to do a dry run on a maiden even if I get there at eight in the morning like you got to be prepared to do a dry run. If it doesn't work out, there's always another day, you know. So I was pretty prepared for that. But then, you know, there was just enough light after sunset if it would start right up. But, you know, you still got to wonder. You set up the the IBEC. You set up, you know, all the wiring to the channels. You've set up the um, ignition wires, the, the plumbing tank. Like, is it all correct or did you see something wrong? The pickup wire from the prop up to the ignition and... 
you got a chance that you know something's wrong even though the motor's broke in oh and then i'd rebuilt the carb and clean the reed block and reassemble that so you're like anything could go wrong so but if not i could get it in the air pretty soon before it was completely black and then i have my 24 year old new friend nick you know so he's flippy he loves to flip so I'm like, fine, I'm so old. I'm like, yeah, go ahead, flip. You know, all my planes, he, he likes to flip the prop. So I'm like, okay, flip it. And he's insisting that we're flooded, but I know we're not, you know? So I'm like, we're not. And he's like, no, we are, you know? And he wants me to like clear it out and everything. And I'm like, oh man, it's not flooded. Kids, I'm telling you kids these days, finally he acquiesces and we go ahead and go on the assumption that it needs to be choked some more and it finally pops. So this takes like 10 minutes. I'm telling you, kids these days. But really, Nick, he's like a throwback kid. Um, he's like a kid from the good old days, 50s and 60s when I was growing up. Actually, I was born in 60, but, you know, 50s was right behind me. Um, so, yeah, that was the story. So I have tried, is that the whole thing? That was pretty much the whole thing. And now, you know, the sun has been set for a few minutes. There's almost no light at all and the engine's running. And so you still got, you know, 100 things you're worried about, 22 year old plane, you've modified all up. Had, you know, some help with the ailerons from my lead carpenter and you're like, what's gonna go wrong here? Um, but no problem, but we, you know, really it was too dark to fly. So lucky to get like five minute flight in and tried a few things. The plane felt real good. Um, I didn't push it at all. I didn't get low, I didn't really. Try to push it. It definitely nose heavy. Maybe the incidences uh, need a little adjustment. The incidence on the motor, left and right and up and down. Little little things, but it felt, felt like a really good plane. And one I could have some fun with. But then I was glad that things worked out like that. That's the, sh the punchline to the whole thing. Because it only left me that five minutes to fly if I'd gotten done earlier Certainly I would have gassed back up and went back up again try to trim things out more get you know some lead on the tail and get some mixes in and, and You know be more aggressive, but since it was so late because I had so many problems um, I Had to stop sooner and then that gave me time to come home and take a look at the plane and you know the rudder seemed pretty iffy after about two minutes in and I'm like, ah, it's probably expos. I really didn't get a chance to set anything. I think I set all the expos like way too high. I did it real fast earlier in the day before I even had a chance and there was no time to redo it before I took off. So it was just kind of like fly with what you got. And, um, but yeah, the rudder was feeling worse. I thought I needed to look at the rates and expos, but what it was, was, um, the whole right dude <laughs> the um hard point had 90 percent um pop loose it was just wobbling back and forth so that's why nothing uh, you know after a couple of minutes nothing was really locked in with the rudder which is you know 100 percent of your flying um this is what the guys would do back then the good builders that i knew and they were they, these guys were excellent builders but they take a hardwood dowel. This is some hardwood. And, you know, they'd, um, most likely they took like a 3 8 copper. This looks like 3 8 Looks about like 3 8 So most likely they took a 3 8 uh, copper pipe for like copper plumbing, sharpened the edge, heated it with a um, torch, and then, you know, pushed it through, maybe even a little at a time. Or they might not have heated it. They might have made serrated edges on it and then just turned it through. Either way, these guys were good. So they made a clean hole in the foam, whichever method they used. And this is what they did throughout the plane. And this is what they did throughout all their planes. You know, so not just this one. And with the 170 inch ounce servos we had then, <laughs> you know, this was, this was good. And that's one of the reasons I went with, uh, well, it's not one. It's the main reason I went with three servos I went with 9381s um, I believe it's been so long on the wings was to spread the load you know because I you know didn't want to trust their hard points and if I went with three you know instead of two it spread the load more less chance of um, breaking one of these out 
But here, you know, there's just one in the rudder, so you can't really spread the load. Uh, spreading the load still a good philosophy, even in the push-pull rudder, in going with two servos instead of one, even if you use two weaker servos instead of one stronger servo, because uh, you're spreading the load across the fuse, too. you got two linkages, two mounts, and, you know, you're spreading the load across the rudder. Even if it's one hard point, it's being pushed uh, on each side. So that can help you, but, yeah, all this work, all this time. I still haven't gap sealed, but, yeah, I'm, I'm still looking at, at the very least, replacing this hard point, uh, which, like I said, I was worried about that um, all along. And hopefully I won't have to do the rest of the hard points. The three on the wings should be enough to spread the load. And then right now I'm one on each elevator, but it's set up for two. They had two servos in each elevator half. And I can do that too and spread the load. Maybe change out. I have one 961, maybe change those out to two 9381s. It's probably what I'll do here too is I got these 961s back here, one on each side. I'll probably change those out to 9381s. Um, just to put less impact on the rudder. The 93, I've had two 9381s on their 500 inch ounce and their hold power is ridiculous. And I've had two of those on so many rudders um, through the years, bigger planes than this, heavier planes than this. And they've worked really well. So I probably end up doing that, saving these for, you know, my modern planes, all these 961s. Because on the modern planes, you can just use those exclusive elevators, rudders, ailerons. So anyway, um, I didn't do this even in the beginning. Maybe, you know, I knew I was flying harder than those guys because um, they are pretty much iMac, iMac dudes. But I never went for this Dal trick. And, you know, I got old pictures and old videos and even you know, down on the deck I used to show people how to put hard points in. Because a lot of times I'd get these ARPs and it's the same today. You know, I just uh, changed the um, hard point on the Extreme Flight 104 Edge 540 on the rudder. And um, I made some videos of that and that was quick and easy. And the method I use on that is it's a three piece and it's the same method I'll do here. And I've been holding this with my left hand the whole time. So I'll do a sandwich and I actually uh, sometimes get this balsa like inch, inch and a half thick. Um, but I can use these pieces, you know, out of this one big piece. Um, or I can see if I could find me the bigger, thicker block laying around here somewhere. Um, but, um, yeah, what I do is, you know, I have, this is aircraft ply right here. So I'll put eighth inch aircraft ply on the outside. Then I'll balsa up the inside because, you know, if it was all aircraft ply, it would weigh quite a bit. Now, this actually needs tail weight, so it wouldn't really matter. But it's just bad form. You know, you, you don't add weight unnecessarily. Um, if you do it with equipment, you know, like adding more servos and stuff, you can take those off, but this can't be removed. So there's just, it's no structural value to adding it through, and it just adds a bunch of weight. So no need. As Mickey Crawley would say, no need, no need. So I do eighth inch aircraft ply, then I do whatever thickness balsa that I need to have, and then I do eighth inch aircraft ply on the other side. Now, I do have um, a bunch of this carbon fiber um, skinned ply. And I'm thinking about using that and not even covering it, just having these two carbon fiber plates, you know, a carbon fiber plate on each side. Just have it, you know, look kind of cool. Uh, or whatever, I don't even care what it looks like. So, But, yeah, that's the sandwich I always do, is aircraft ply, eighth inch aircraft ply on each side, and then balsa all in the middle. And then I'm going to go, you know, one and a half, one and a half. So they had this little three-eighths dowel um, through the foam. And you could see that on the foam, um, you know, the glue really doesn't stick. Uh, it, you know, it sticks to the foam, but the foam, you know, see how coarse the foam, it, foam is, you know, and it doesn't, um, it doesn't get that much bite. And you can see that that's, that's glue, but it, it didn't really stick that well to the foam. See how well it stuck to the balsa bevel? Uh, that gets just a cap on the end of all surfaces when you do these wings and planes. Um, you just take a, you know, a balsa block like this, you know, but thicker. Uh, these are three quarter usually. And then, um, you know, sand the bevels on it, glue that on. Um, you could see here that the, the dowel really stuck good to the balsa. That's all balsa on there. But on the foam side, the, you know, no sticky. 
so you know when the those uh, 800 inch ounce servos uh, that 1600 inch ounce total went, went to prying on that one 3 8 dowel in that soft coarse foam yeah it just blew it out um, you can see it stuck a little bit to the balsa and that's what kept it going but when it broke loose of the balsa then she was gone um, but yeah I'll put this sandwich in there it's, it'll be an inch and a uh, half square and um, so I'll, I'll uh, chop all this out It'll be real straight and neat, you know. I'll cut it real, real even and flush so there won't be chunky at all. And um, then when it's, yeah, real clean and nice one and a quarter um, hole through there. And I'll cut all this. I'll cut the bigger balsa here. I'll cut as many pieces of this as I need. So one and a half by one and a half squares. Till it's as thick as I need to go through the center. And have this eighth inch aircraft ply one and a half inch square on each side or you know maybe the carbon fiber but then that way um, you know when your bolt uh, you can even use um, you know standard fiberglass phenolic carbon fiber control horns like the modern planes but I'll use a bolt in this instant most likely either I have plenty of those um, composite horns I could use if I want I, mean, I could change my mind but Likely I'll just run a bolt through. So let's imagine you put a bolt through and you got this eighth inch aircraft ply, all this balsa and eight balsa, balsa and eighth inch aircraft ply on the other side. When you run that bolt all the way through and it gets, you know, clevis on this side and a clevis on this side of that sandwich, then, you know, not only is all the balsa, which will be hardened with CA and stuff and, you know, glue, if I stack them like this, it'll have epoxy between each layer. So I'll be pretty stiff, you know, the bolt going through there. But then it's got to go through that eighth inch aircraft ply um, on each side, which I'll harden with CA2 after I drill the hole and then redrill it after the CA. Then, um, you know, it's like steel at that point. So that bolt, um, it can't shift. And then the fact it's one and a half inch square, um, it gives you so much structure, you know, for that thing. It's got so much meat. This is um, about an inch and a half thick, too. So it just got all that meat in a square shape uh, to where it you know, just can't rotate or be pulled out. I mean, your plane is only as strong as its weakest point, and that will not be the weakest point on the plane. Um, hopefully I won't have to do this to any of the other surfaces, the other hard points. I don't think I will. This is the one that I worried about, and sure enough, this is the one that cut loose. But nice that it didn't you know, break and have the rudder like get all jammed up on the linkage and like stuck over like 40 degrees one way um, on those 1600 inch ounce worth of servos and on the maiden. <laughs> you know, I would have had to deal with that. <clears throat> um, yeah, do some kind of knife edge landing and try to tilt over on one wing <laughs> without hitting a wing. I mean, you know, right before I land. So, yeah. So, um, yeah punchline again is that you know all that all the headaches of getting it ready and having young Nick sit there tell me it was flooded and flipping all that extra time has saved me you know it kept me from having any air time before it was pitch black and that saved me from this thing completely popping out and jamming over to one side and ruining my day um, so that's a story on that and I think I already went over the fact that yeah it you know, these were great planes, and it's still a great plane. Oh, yeah, the um, there's some people that know they're great. Any of the guys that used to fly them, and one of those guys is um, Kim Quinette. So he already, he sent me a text um, this morning, you know, after I made, well, Sunday morning after, like, 5.30 in the morning after I put the maiden on, you know, Saturday night at 7.45 or 8 or whenever it was. Um, and he goes, yeah, how do you like that Airworks Extra 300 kit? you know those things are sweet and I was like oh you notice you know and um so probably nostalgic for him too you know he's been flying forever and um he's the you know one of the best builders around builds all these planes and yeah he knew and then he was uh trying to tell me where to get the carbon fiber stuff for it um probably Camaro will get the carbon fiber landing gear because EF's out of stock on the gear I wanted from them, I've been back ordered for a couple months because this aluminum gear, these things weigh a ton. I'll weigh it for you when I take it off, but usually the carbon fiber is well less than half of the weight um, of the aluminum. And then 
he was sorting me on um, getting the carbon fiber wing tube and stab tube. Uh, so this thing will shed, you know, probably two pounds on that stuff, at least a pound and a half, which is huge if it's a pound and a half and it might, might shed up to two pounds on that. And it was already floaty and light. I couldn't get it to land. <laughs> it surprised me. You know, I thought it was going to, uh, uh, you know, uh, what's the right word, but, you know, have a bunch of drag and stop real quick, you know, um, but, um, yeah, I just wanted to float away, which is pretty cool. And, yeah, it felt very, you know, it's very stable. Old school. You know, it's longer tail moment, wider stabs, you know, more draggy wing um, airfoils, you know, and, uh, and leading edges. So, yeah, very stable, very locked in. It felt like it did really feel locked in, like, on tracking. You know, I shouldn't say locked in. It did feel locked in, but it felt so good on tracking uh this guy was an imac pilot and that's why i'm so lucky he made such big surfaces on everything the elevators i had you know plenty of elevator way plenty of ailerons kind of shocking um but yeah he was an imac guy and these planes were known to be really good anyway and it really tracked good it just yeah it felt super solid in the air like it was it was going nowhere but straight you know but then with the work i did on it the roll rate was great the elevators were good, um, you know, I did, you know, inverted flat spin, all that stuff, um, was able to torque roll, but the CG is so nose heavy, as soon as I roll that CG back, you know, the elevator is really going to get lively, and yeah, we'll see what I do. This plane, I think I could fly it as hard as any plane I have, and really put up a killer flight with it, if I'm willing to you know, have the confidence that, um, it'll stay together. <laughs> and like one of the guys posted on YouTube, he goes, man, there's old planes. I've, I've flown these 20 year old planes, 25 year old planes, and they stay together. And yeah, and I'll look at all the joints and stuff. And none of that seems to come apart. I've seen the motor boxes fly apart on ARFs, you know, but these kits, they use good aircraft fly, you know, um, but you know, it's not that same kind of feeling you get with an extreme flight or skywing plane where they have the carbon fiber tubes running through all four corners of the motor box for reinforcement all that stuff. Like, you know, that thing's going to hold together. Um, yeah, but it, yeah, it should, it should hold together. I know it will hold together better if it's lighter, which is one of the reasons, like I said, it flies good. Um, doesn't need to be lighter to put up a killer flight with it, but you know, less inertia, less chance of breaking something. So I'm really looking forward to getting the, replacing all the aluminum parts on this with the carbon fiber parts. Um, yeah, motor was ballistic, just a total bottle rocket. I never even had to get on it. It's barely above idle, just honking around. And so you got amazing power there. Um, yeah, everything, everything's everything. Um, the video is hard to edit and make it kind of cool for you guys because uh, Nick had never taken it before with my cell phone so he left it all on one X which is like pretty wide angle so I was a pin dot we call it pin dot videos so he, he don't have the uh, Spiel, Alvin Spielberg mastery yet <laughs> but hey it was just his first time and I was glad to have the video to to uh, document you know the maiden on this thing in the dark um yeah, I told you, you, you guys want a story that's a 24-minute story about nothing, really. <laughs> but I was going to, you know, put this thing aside until, like, I can get all the composite parts and then um, do, you know, a little fine-tuning on everything and, like, you know, who knows, like, another six months from now or something. And then, yeah, I came out and started tearing this apart and getting the materials ready, you know, so... I'll probably just put this control horn hard point in and then just go ahead and, you know, at that point you just drill a hole through um, and put the linkages back on. So I'll probably go ahead and finish it up and start flying it again. <laughs> um, it's pretty funny, you know, I really found my dream plane in the Extreme Flight 104 Edge 540. That's my plane, hands down, period. Um, and, you know, started getting uh, pretty locked into it and, you know, got the event coming up in November and instead of staying just on that plane and trying to really get, you know, a good routine together and really get even more dialed with it and everything, I get sidetracked. 
I think there's something to that. You know, it's like we do that to ourselves. <laughs> like that's not, it's not like, you know, an accident or, you know, some series of bad events. Like I can be flying that plane every day and I choose to start messing around with this other stuff. But, and right now I'm really thinking, you know, I want to get this over because I really want to get the Hangar 9 extra together because I really want to start rougher rolling like three feet high again like I was doing a few months ago. Um, but I was only doing that because I was flying planes I didn't care about. Which that one too, that trash can plane um, that went into the tree, that's all repaired. I just have to do the covering, so there's that whole thing. All that stuff takes time. Yeah, I'm coming full circle to why am I not way better, which is the goal because I'm not flying because <laughs> I'm playing with these projects <laughs> so, there's some sign of psychology here is all I'm trying to say and I can see it and I, you know I can't seem to uh, work it out but um, yeah I think that's everything alright out <laughs>